wash away My heart is ready Yes, we are going rise for this journey Rise in the morning and give you thanks and praise Almighty One, my heart is ready Yes, we are going rise for this journey Rise in the morning and give you thanks and praise
sing one more song. Create a sanctuary, a dwelling 
son, every daughter. Abba, where there's healing that is needed physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Relational. Fathers, mothers, sons, daughters, husbands, wives, grandparents, grandsons, granddaughters. We pray for complete healing. In physical struggles, Abba, we ask that you would touch us all where we need it. I speak to your bones, that your bones are filled with beauty and filled with life. Every organ in your body is beautiful. Tiferet. The Tiferet of Yahuwah engulfs even the organs of your body. That your blood flows with the rhythm of life. The life of Elohim flows through our bloodstream, permeating every red cell, every white cell. The immune systems of your sons and daughters, let there be a balance. Let numbness be removed from arms and legs, ankles and feet. Let all forms of stress and anxiety be lifted right now. Right now. We thank you, Abba. Because you are filled with chesed and rachamim towards your people. We thank you, Abba. Toda Rabba. Thank you so much. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Right. Can we have a seat? No, stay standing. We're going to sound the show bar. Come on. Are we doing announcements right now or after? After? I think there's some that think we're on uh, Australian time. They come like way at the end. <laughs> We're going to sound the shofar and uh, Bernie, can you do the honor? Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Baruch Atah
Yeah. Right, you go with Bernie. Can I say something? Yes, you can. Yeah. All right. Shalom, everybody. Shalom! All right. So, with the youth, I'm going to be doing something different. We're going to have a, work, a little handout that we're going to do every week. It's going to go through the whole scriptures. And wow. so, I want you all to be here every week. We're not going to stop. If you're not here, you miss it. And if you don't learn it, that sucks. Yeah! <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and I want the parents to make sure they do it. Accountability! And always bring a Bible for everyone, so we're going to be a lottery. And we're going to go through the whole scriptures, and it's going to take a lot of time, but there's no rush. Yeah! All in one day. <laughs> Can we go to the... We're going we're gonna to speak a, a blessing over the young ones. Oh, over the youth, too. Come on up. All right. Any priest of the home ready to do the uh, blessing? Anybody yet? Okay, keep practicing. Can we all stand up and stretch our hands towards our sons and our daughters? Continue in the parables, and it's like, man, which one do you pick? They're, they're so amazing. Just reading through them throughout the entire week is just so powerful. I like something that uh, Avi Ben Mordecai. I don't know how many people know who Avi is. Yeah, he's been out here before. Mm -hmm. um, he gave a, a loving admonition for those that are really into the secrets of the Torah, right? Yeah. Uh, which falls under that umbrella of the Kabbalistic, almost you know, esoteric, mystical things that can be very dangerous. He gave a loving admonition and said, stay away from Kabbalah and look at the words of Mashiach. Those are the true mysteries. Yeah. And you can't argue with that because when Messiah spoke, he spoke so profoundly. Mm -hmm. And he spoke truth. And he, when he spoke, he touched 
everyone and everything within his vicinity. Think about that. Imagine sitting down at the last second, having to communicate to a people, not only to the people, but to everything around you. And you're able to do that within a few words, and it impacts everything around you. That's the way the Mashiach spoke. Wow. He didn't use a PowerPoint. He didn't use a Word doc. He is the Word. Wow. He is the standard that we have to live up to. Not anybody else. We don't have to live up to the standard of this person or that person. See, within human nature, as soon as you accomplish something, say within the text, or you learn something, you learn how to pronounce something, you begin to flow. The human nature, because of our animal nature, will tend to try to think it's accomplished something in its own power. And Abba will quickly bring us back down to where we really are. <laughs> We need to understand that the, the treasures within the Torah are so profound and so powerful that it is just mind-blowing. I actually put this up just uh, today. I wanted to look at this verse in Yid Miyahu. Jeremiah 6.16 says this, Thus said Yahweh, Stand in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths. Old paths is where we're going to be having Sukkot, by the way. <laughs> Yeah. That's where they get this from, their, the name of their assembly. Where the good way is, and walk in it, and find rest for yourselves. And then look, it goes on to say, but they said, we do not walk in it. It's important for us to walk and ask for the old paths of Yah, the cycles of righteousness. Very, very important. We need to walk in those. I'm not going to do that. So this is going to be part three. <coughs> Counting the introduction is actually part four. So this is part three, but the fourth part. Yeah. Which is the kingdom parables of the royal high priest, Yahushua Hamashiach. The kingdom parables, which there's how many? Uh, Forty. Fourteen, Fourteen kingdom parables. I mentioned seven that are found in Matthew 13, but there's 14 kingdom parables. And I find that interesting because when you read the book of Matthew, you have the genealogy of the Mashiach broken up into 14 specific categories. 14 is the numerical value for King David, Dawid. You have 14 knuckles, I think, on each hand, right? Remember that old teaching? Did you guys know that? No. If you have six fingers, oh, yeah. then we have a problem. Uh, <laughs> and then you're in a totally different category. But there's 14 knuckle joints on each hand uh, yeah. representing that, that kingship, even in our hands. The way we're made up, Abba is so perfect in, in all that he creates. Wow. We're going to be looking at old and new. The Old Testament and the New Testament. No, we're not going to look at that. <laughs> <laughs> the old wineskins and the new wineskins. Before we get to that, we're going to look at a specific parable as well. See, Mashiach pointed and taught, pointed to things and taught in parables more than anything else. We now come to our third part to the series entitled Kingdom Parables of the Royal Priest. But more exact would be the Kingdom Parables of the Royal High Priest, Yahushua Mashiach. These are his parables. This is what he spoke. This is how he communicated to the crowds. And then he explained these things to those that were closest to him when he went into the house. It is agreed that Yahushua taught in parable form more than any other way aside from how he lived. When he taught verbally, he taught in parable form. But more than that, he taught by the way he lived more than anything else. So the greatest way you can teach anybody anything is by the way you live. How you live speaks more than what you say. People say a lot of things. When we look at, at how they live in front of us and around, when you're at work, when you're at school, when you're at home, whatever it might be, that shows exactly who you are or who you are struggling with. 
So let us get right into this week's study on the marriage of the king's son and the parable of the garments and the wineskins. Is that alright? Yeah! There's a lot of information in these, so I didn't put it all in here. There's like no way we'd be here forever. I wanted to combine these two uh, and bring out some interesting things. The marriage of the, of the king's son. The marriage of the king's son. The very setting of this parable is the same as the parable of the vineyard and the wicked vine dresser. You have to read that on your own. This was given on one of the days. This is what I find very fascinating. This was given on one of the days that Yahushua was teaching within the temple area. So remember the location where he's at and then what he's teaching has everything to do with the scenery around him. He's speaking to everyone and everything around him. He was making a declaration by everything he said and everything he did and everywhere he went. Very important for you to know that. As we will see in the reading, when an individual or group reject the eternal divine power's invitation, listen, to come into kingdom standing, then there comes judgment from the divine eternal power. If we reject the invitation, then what we will be left with is judgment upon our life. We don't want that. When the invitation is given, we better take that invite. And not just show up. You, you know what? You ever give a... <laughs> I don't know about you, Victoria, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> You know, you, there's someone's party coming up and you pass out like certain invites to certain individuals and all of a sudden someone you don't even know, they just show up. They sit down and they, were, they weren't even given an invite and then they're walking around in your home or apartment or whatever. You don't even know who that is. You got a stranger in your home. You're like, what the heck? Who is this? And somebody say, no, everybody can come to my house. And all of a sudden, who knows what happened? <laughs> we have to use wisdom, you know, not just say, hey, hey, come on in. You need to know who's coming in your home nowadays. Right. Maybe 50, 60 years ago was a totally different thing. Today it's, it's different now. Now you need to know who's who. But it's, it's similar to this right here. Someone who rejects the invitation, but yet they want to show up, and they have no idea what the entire event is about, the banquet. Mm -hmm. They just come on in. They're going to stick out like a sore thumb which will not be a good thing that we're going to wind up looking at when we connect it to the parable. We saw this since the book of Breshit. Interesting, in Matthew, we will notice the focus is on the king's son and in his marriage, while in Luke, the focus is on the supper itself. So when you look at this parable, you see in the book of Matthew, it's Matthew is focusing on the king's son and the marriage specifically. And then when you look at, at Luke, when Luke begins to write about this parable, Luke is emphasizing the actual banquet supper and some details with that. They're both talking about the same thing, it's just that they're both looking at it from different angles and yet it all goes together. So we need to understand that with the Gospels or the Bessarot, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John, they're speaking. When you see similar things transpiring, being taught, they're just looking at these events from different angles. Doesn't mean that, ah, here's a flaw, so we need to throw that book out. That's not, that has nothing to do with it. They're recording from a different angle and from their perspective of this truth that transpired. So you have that within the scriptures, and we can never forget that because then people will end up starting to throw stuff out and begin to replace things and begin to make up their own religion. That's dangerous. So we have a side-by-side -side revelation of importance to this banquet feast with the Son and His marriage. This is what we're going to be looking at briefly. So beginning without any hesitation. Matthew 22, verse 1. You can find this. There. And Yahushua responded and spoke to them again by parables. Notice this. Since we started this, you probably realize that more than anything else now, that when the Mashiach began to teach, he, he was speaking mainly in parable, parabolic language. The kingdom of the heavens is like a man, a sovereign. And I'm going to be pausing in between to expound on these things. This like a man or a sovereign is a man of foundational power. So he's saying the kingdom of heaven is like a man, a specific man who has foundational power. When you look at the words and you take it back to Greek and, and so on and so forth. Can you guys see it? Oh. 
Thank you, Johnny. So this man of foundational power who made a wedding feast for his son and he sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast. When in the history of Israel, and this is a question, when in the history of Israel was there any type of proposal in marriage to the nation of Israel? When in the history of Israel was there a proposal type of Thing. Back in Mount Sinai. Right? At Mount Sinai. The only place we see this transpiring is at Mount Sinai in Exodus 19 to 20. We have the proposal that is given by Yah Himself in Exodus Shemot 19, verse 5, which says this, but there's something so fascinating with the language of Israel from the beginning and then at the end, which says this. If you will obey my voice and guard my covenant, then you will be a segula, a special treasure. Then in Shemot 19, 6, verse 7, 7 and 8 in the Tanakh, we have the agreement to this very proposal of the covenant, but all they say is this, Nase, we will do. There's no Venishma yet, it's just Nase, right there, that's all they say. They said, oh, we'll do it. We'll do what you said. But the only problem with this is that Israel never agreed to the Vanishma part of the covenant, which is vital. And therefore the birth of breaking covenant emerged because of what they said. In order for one to truly be doing what covenant Torah says, there must be the Vanishma and the hearing part of it. You must engage in the hearing part of what he's saying, not just say I'll do that. There must be something that goes in and transpires on the inside of us in order for us to truly do something, otherwise it's just mechanics. That's why Shema Yisrael, the importance of hearing, hearing some of the first miracles that the Mashiach did was cause people to hear again, to see again. We need to understand that he was making a declaration with everything he did. We must shma Yisrael because this deals with the inner man of the heart where true circumcision takes place. And it wouldn't be until the sealing of this specific covenant with Israel in Shemot, Exodus 24-7, that the people would say what? Ko asher diber Yahuwah naaseh vanishma. Now they say at the end of the covenant, right before it's going to get broken, now they say we will hear and then we will do. When you're supposed to agree with that from the beginning. All they said was not nah, say we'll do. They never said we will hear. We have to hear and obey. We have to hear intelligently. When you hear the scriptures, you have to understand what it is you're supposed to be doing so that when you do it, there's true confirmation in your soul, in your inner man. Otherwise, it's just robotics. It's just mechanics. There's no life in it. There's no life in a robot. It's some kind of a vessel that has no soul. But human beings have a soul. We have a deep conviction and a deep attachment to spiritual things. So when we attach ourselves to the proper spiritual things of the Torah, now there's true life that's being presented. Right now, what are they trying to do? Remove the soul of human beings and create hybrids by the year 2000 and what, 27 or something? Or 23, I forget what it is. This is when we will be walking amongst, excuse me, what will be walking amongst us are hybrids that look just like you and I. In Shavuot 19, the Hebrew word Venishma is missing. The Vav, the letter of connection, if you call it a Wa or a Vav, or a Wow. You hear what people say, Wow? They hear something you've probably never heard before. Yeah. Or people go, Wow. They just got connected to something they didn't understand. That's related to the letter Vav. Yeah. Wow. Seriously, it sounds like so weird, but that's another pronunciation of the Hebrew letter Vav. Wow, wow. So when you go like, wow, I didn't know that. 
<laughs> See, there's a connection. See, yeah, that's like funny, but it's true. <laughs> wow. So the vav of the nishma connects the hearing to the doing. This segula, say segula, segula, is like the pearl of great price, also found in Matthew 13, one of the kingdom parables. A segula, a treasure possession, is in the field. And the man, the individual, purchases the whole field for the sake of that special treasure. So he purchases the whole field. That means he can do what he wants with the field. That doesn't mean that everything in it is his special treasure. Israel is called the segula. He's speaking to Israel. You shall be to me a segula. A special treasure, Israel. That means the rest of the world. That doesn't mean those are his special treasures. You have to come into the special treasure out from the world in order to be part of that precious treasure. Because the rest of the world is going to be dug up, beat up, pulled up, ripped up, and burned up. We don't want to be outside of the segula. Uh We want to be in it. We want to be part of it. Yahweh yeah, never made covenant with any other nation in the world, and that won't go over well everywhere. Well, God so loved the world, He sure did, for Elohim so loved the field, the land, the, the land, wherever Israel's at, He loves the whole land. Why? Because His special treasure is in it. He writes His name in the land. People translate that as earth to make it like a global thing, and maybe it is. But Eretz can mean an established land, remember? Eretz is an established type of land. Adama is a land of soft soil that is that is that can be cultivated and formed and shaped. Israel is made up of 12 tribes and in Revelation 21 we have the 12 gates which are solid pearl. No coincidence, pearl of great price, solid pearl. And are named after the 12 tribes of Israel. The field is the world, and the world, all 12 tribes have been hidden until the price was paid for the world, the land, with his very blood and life, the very life of Yahushua. He purchased the land back. He paid the price. We talked about that a couple weeks ago, I think. But as the scripture goes on, the invitation is given, but the scripture says this in this parable, but they would not come to this invitation. The invitation is given, but rejection of the invite is rejection of the one given. If you reject the invitation and say, you know what, I'll wait until I'm on my deathbed. And at my last breath, forgive me, that's not going to work. There's not going to be a drop of conviction there. You're going to be doing that out of nothing but fear and trembling. No deep conviction of the heart. No circumcision. No mulot. No circumcision in your heart. None. Milah. Brit milah haled, which is that circumcision of the heart. None. Zero. Zero. Matthew 22, 4, again, he sent out other servants saying, Say to those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. Listen, my oxen and fatted calf, cattle are slaughtered and everything is ready. So the dinner, the feasts are ready. Are you coming or will you reject the invitation? You know, we're going to have Yom Kippur. I'm going to do a teaching on Yom Kippur and I have a subtitle I'll give you guys. You want to hear it? Yeah. It's yeah. kind of weird. And it came when I was thinking about our daughter Ashley, who had to book her flight to come up. So the title is this: Everyone has a booked flight. Mm. Everyone's flight is booked. How do we know that? You go to the Book of Revelation. The books are open. You're booked. You uh-huh. are in one of the books. Yeah. We all have a booked flight. But not everyone's going to the same place. Just a little disclaimer for what's coming up. Yahweh has always risen up prophets to a rebellious nation. So what we have hidden here is the history of Israel up to the coming of Yahushua HaMashiach in the parables. 
Matthew 15, 24, Yahushua declares why he came. He said, I only come for the prostituting house of Israel. She's been prostituting. When you read the book of Ezekiel, specifically chapter 8, verse 1, all the way to 19, that's the first actual part of that book. And there's a gentleman that actually wrote a book on that. I didn't realize, I'm trying to remember the name, I can't remember the name. He wrote a book on that, and it's really fascinating, the evidence that is there. It is the first part of that library of Ezekiel, and it, it speaks about the corruption of the nation of Israel and the temple corruption of that time. I heard that it was the last scroll, the 13th scroll, that the first part of Ezekiel yeah, verse chapter 1 all the way through so seven, to 7 is, is actually the end part. Right, right, right. right. That's, that's in the book. Right. So look at this. First, Yahweh sends his, sends his prophets to a wayward nation with the clarion call of Teshuvah, repentance. Return back to covenant relationship as was, as was presented at Mount Sinai. But to no avail, Israel rejected and killed all the prophets that would come, as Yahushua said. He said it. He said, you, Jerusalem, 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 who does what? Embraces the prophets? Welcomes the prophets? Encourages them to come to their feast days? No, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets? Nehemiah 9.26 But they were disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your Torah behind their backs and they killed your prophets who testified against them to turn them to you and they worked great blasphemies the book of Nehemiah Matthew 23.33 says this serpents offspring of snakes and vipers those are some strong words how shall you escape the judgment of Gehenna, the trash heap of fire? Because of this, behold, I send to you prophets and wise ones and scribes, those who will speak the truth of his word, those who will declare what is written, not something else. The prophets who will come declaring, not that you're going to have a million bucks, but that you will get right and make Teshuvah repentance. And some of them you have you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and will persecute from city to city, so that should come on you all the righteous blood poured out on the earth, the land, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the set-apart place and the altar. You know who Zach, which Zechariah this is? Anybody? Father of John. Father. Reuben? Father of John. It's believed to be the Zechariah of Yohanan Hamadbil, his father, who was, who was killed later between the altar. Interesting. So there's an argument there, but I find that very fascinating. How that's in that place like that. Truly I say to you, all these things will come on this generation. Verse 37. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one killing the prophets and stoning those sent to her. How often I desire to gather your children, your sons and daughters, in the way a bird gathers her chicks under her wings. And you did not desire it. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, in no way shall you see me from now on until you say what? Baruch Hashem Yahuwah. Baruch Hashem Yahuwah. He's saying, you will not see me from henceforth until you say, Baruch Hashem Yahweh. Blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahuwah. It should say this, blessed is he who is coming. He is in the name, the one clothed in the name. Yod -Heh -Heh. Yeah. Come to the wedding feast. Continuing on with this parable, the first part of the king and, and his son's marriage supper. But they disregarded and went their way. This one to his field and that one to his trade. And the rest, having seized his servants, insulted and killed them. 
But when the sovereign heard, he was wroth and sent out his soldiers, destroyed those murderers, and set their city on fire. You see, Abba uses the enemies as it of Israel. When Israel is in rebellion, he will use them to bring judgment on the nation. And he's done it for thousands of years. They become soldiers at his bidding. Why? Because he's the sovereign one seated on the throne. He is in control. And he will use China. He will use Russia. He will use Hamas. He will use ISIS. He will use the wicked of the wicked of the world to inflict the punishment of judgment because of rebellion. So sometimes when we're praying against those things, which there's nothing wrong with praying, we just might not have the understanding of what He's doing because of a rebellious country. Right. He does this. Yahushua spoke of the prophetic words of not one stone would be left standing upon the other. In 70 of the common era, Jerusalem was raised and destroyed. Raised means destroyed, like raped. With Prince Titus and many of the so-called Le Levitical priests, the words of Yahushua came to fulfillment and the temple was destroyed by the Roman authority. It happened. Verse 8, then he said to his servants, the wedding feast indeed is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. What kind of garments are you wearing right now? So I'm wearing all white? That doesn't, get, that doesn't guarantee me anything. We could try to dress up and wear, I wear this because I have a few gar uh, things that I wear for Shabbat, I like all the time. And this is one of them, I just wear this. But this is not the garment of righteousness. The garment of righteousness is not physical. It's supernatural. It's spiritual. Putting on the Mashiach. We need to understand what that means. We're going to look at that. Putting on the Mashiach. This one, we have the garments and the one, the king comes into the banquet hall and says this, he's, he looks into the guests. So imagine... You find yourself coming in and you know you have not been right. And you're sitting there and all of a sudden you're like, I'm in. I'm in. I made it. I made it. I just did all kinds of stuff like 20 minutes ago, but I made it. I'm in. And so the king comes in. And he begins to look at the guests. And doesn't give a, a, a specific time frame. It just says he looks at the guests and then he sees a man with no garment on. Doesn't give the name of that man. Would that be someone in here? Someone you know? He comes looking to see what garments. And this is why you have the words of the Mashiach also. I think it's in Luke where he says there will be those sitting in the kingdom with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who will be snatched out and thrown into outer darkness. I thought once you're in, you're in. The heavy words of the Mashiach. This is why we need to examine ourselves to make sure we are right. Yes. <laughs> I'm trying to remember it. I think it might be Luke 18 or something. I might be wrong. Someone finds it. Remember the uh, the panel we had last week? Are there any curses in the covenant? Well, well yes. Where at? It's in there. You got to read it. So it's in there. It's somewhere in there. <laughs> That'd be a good panel, huh? Hey, where does it say that? Oh, it's in the Bible. We're at between those books that are there. Somewhere in there. I heard someone talking about it. But let me know when you find it, because I was trying to think of the verse right now, and it doesn't come to my mind right off the bat. It's written in my heart somewhere at the search for it. See, we got to do that inner search in all of us. And those servants went out into the street corners and gathered all whom they found. You have some translations that say both evil and good. Bad translation. Well, I give you, I'm going to give you the actual wording here. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. 
And when the sovereign came into view, the guests, the word in there means he was looking inside of the guests. He saw there a man who had not put on a wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, Chavar, Chavarim, friends, right? How did you come in here? Not having a wedding garment. How did you get in here? And the scripture says he was speechless. Why? He knew he was standing before the king. Excuse me. He knew he was, yeah, he was standing before the king. Because when the king walks in, everyone stands. He's coming in. How are you standing today? Shaul said, having done all to stand, he didn't say sit, he said stand. Amut, where we get the Amida from, like that Amida prayer, powerful prayer. In other words, having done all to stand, pray that you will still sustain the strength and power to continue to stand. Don't give up. The scripture says he was speechless. Then the sovereign said to the servants, bind him hand and foot. Take him away and throw him out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called and few are chosen. Many are called to the banquet, but few will be chosen. The few are those who have the garments of righteousness. On them, the garments of the Mashiach. Many are going to come. We really cannot comprehend that. you got the smartest theologians dissecting these parables. And they're assuming their personal convictions in many areas. But in all reality, we don't really comprehend what that's going to look like. Many are called into what? He's talking about the feast of the, for the sun. The banquet hall. Many are called, but few are chosen. It doesn't say few enter, it says many are called. So many are going to come, but few will be chosen. This is why we have to self-examine ourselves. We have to self-examine ourselves. Look deep down inside of ourselves. Introspection. Verse 10, And those servants went out into the highways and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. It was filled with the bad and the good, and probably the ugly. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Wasn't there a cowboy movie like that? You have some of the most beautiful people that are ugly to the bone because of the attitude and stuff like that. But let's look at this. We have the servants that are sent to the first invite. These servants stretch across the time element, touching the lives of many, speaking of the truths of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the goodness of the Creator from the beginning. From Adam to his sons Noah, Abraham, Moshe, Eliyahu, Yeshiahu, Yimiyahu, Yechezkiel. Try saying that 25 times. The prophets. Yohanan being the greatest of these claimed to be the friend of the bridegroom and rejoiced at his coming. You can read that in John 3, 27 to 30. John says the friend of the bridegroom rejoices because he has arrived. And he says, I rejoice because he is here. Yohanan goes on to say in verse 30 that he must increase. Notice that the bridegroom must increase. And I must decrease. Humility. Powerful declaration from Israel's true Aaronic high priest who was declared, who has declared the decreasing of this priesthood in order for the Mashiach to accomplish the work of Tzedekah. He's saying this, John was the actual true high priest of the time. And he's saying, what I represent must decrease. And it will. And it has begun already, people. But he will increase. And the disciples that have once followed me will come into the order of the Kohen Hagadol of eternity. That's right. And we will follow him and serve him because I must decrease what John is saying. I'm paraphrasing big time. Yeah. The servants are all who were sent to Israel to return back to covenant. Especially during the days of Yahushua, we see this peak in those who were sent. He is the sent one. 
But his own refused his very call. John 1.11 it says this, He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right, not the privilege, the authority, the right, to become sons of Elohim to the ones believing into his name. Then we have the servants that are sent for the second invitation because the other ones were not paying attention. The first will be connected to the call of the prophets to all Israel in need of returning, but would have to come through the schoolmaster. Listen, would have to come through the, the schoolmaster first, which is seen in the sacrificial system. So the prophets actually said, return to the ways of Yah, but you're going to have to come through the schoolmaster of the sons of Aaron. Because of rebellion before. You come through that. That's your schoolmaster to teach you of the coming Mashiach. You won't be able to return to him yet because we rebelled. And Abba set up a school system. Not of Hillel and Shammai. But of a Aaronic priesthood order of things. And he says you're going to have to come through that schoolmaster. To learn what it means to return to Yah. So that becomes as an old garment. The second invitation goes beyond the first. The oxen and fatted calf have been killed. And interesting, this Greek phrase here for oxen and fatted calf, listen, can be rendered as coming to an end. So the oxen and fatted calf have been slaughtered. The Greek implication, because there's no grammar, can actually render it as coming to an end. This oxen sacrificial system under Aaron has come to an end. Yeah. The sacrificial system has come to an end and it's time to enter through the invite, which is the narrow path of righteousness. Hallelujah. And I'm talking about parables here. We're looking at them. We're just pulling some information, some words out to get more understanding of what the Mashiach was implementing. He was implementing the truth of truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He came to present something so powerful. It says that the second set of servants go out into the highways and the byways. The Greek word used here speaks of a road, a journey. And I like this one definition. A gradual unfolding progress of something. So the highways where people are that didn't come at the first invitation because they didn't know, they've entered into the gradual process, excuse me, unfolding progress of something. So you don't have to come to the complete arrival and all knowledge of who the Mashiach is on every single level because it's still unfolding. But at least come into the unfolding progress and understanding because a servant will come and say, Hey, I got an invite with your name on it. He's calling you in. But I've just begun this walk. It's okay. Come on in. Some are given more talents than others. But you're still seen as one. Come on in. It's not your fault you were born now while others were born thousands of years ago. It's your turn to come on in. So wait for that invitation. How many of you have anybody received a, a rapture invitation yet? So, <laughs> why are you still here? So look at this. <clears throat> the journey, whether physical, mental, or spiritual, depends on you or your life. This highway is seen throughout time where all who have entered this path and journey of righteousness, even more so today with the powerful revelation of Yahushua and what he came to do and accomplish as the Melech Sadiq. On this highway of spiritual life are those who have arrived to the understanding of the one speaking these parables, and there are those who have just begun. So this word in Greek happens to be a multi-dimensional word that doesn't leave anybody out. Let's look at bad and good because those are the ones that fill up the banquet hall. They're the guests now. Here is where language barriers begin to crumble, especially things translated into English. 
bad comes from the Greek word meaning those full of labor. You've been laboring for so long. Are those who are hard pressed, hardship, harassed by taskmasters, those in the time of peril and tribulation. So the bad are not necessarily someone wicked. It's someone who has been laboring for such a long time now. And the servants say, your rest has come. Come to the marriage supper of the Lamb. There is coming the time when those in the end of the age will have the greatest revelation of you, who Yahushua is. Good are those who have put on the righteousness of the Mashiach, which is the tzaddik of us all. So this wedding will be filled with those who have been laboring in the field, laboring for righteousness. These will be brought into the wedding banquet and will remove the clothes of this world's trials and put on the garments of praise and beauty, as the writers yeah. of Scripture said. It is not supposed to be an easy thing. To walk the path of righteousness is supposed to be laborious, hard. It's not supposed to be easy. There are seasons of things being lighter than others. But it's not supposed to be a, a clean, slick path, a, a slip and slide all the way down into the kingdom. Hey, Jenny! <laughs> it's not supposed to be like that. If it's all easy... Everything's just like great. Your faith has not even been tested. Has not been. I was just saying your name wasn't calling on you. No, no. I was, okay. I That's heard. Today, I heard today <laughs> that you know Satan wants to bless you and make everything easy, and you know. Right. It blinds, blinds you. Right. Blinds you. He would love for yeah. you to win the lottery. Right. Right. All of us. Right. And all of us would be like this. You know, if I win the lottery, man, you know what? Well, no one would be without. Right when they dropped it in your account, you probably little horns are just be like this. <laughs> Some bigger than others, you know. <laughs> you got that so far. <laughs> he knows what we would do and what we want. No matter how much we say right now, I want. I promise, I would do this. Really, he knows you. Abba, you know us better than we know us. So can you please give no, us? <laughs> so look at this. There's coming the time when those in the end of the age will have the greatest revelation of the Mashiach. Every one of us. We're having a greater and greater revelation. We have the furnishings of this banquet. This word is self-evident. The Greek word here means to be full filled up and expanded so the guests of the banquet hall will be the furnishings of the banquet hall. They will be the ones that fill up. They are the furnishings of the banquet hall. We will be part of this banquet. The Hebrew word is melo as in melo hagoim. I find that so interesting. The Mashiach uses his word specifically. And the melo hagoim is the fullness of the Gentiles promised to Father Abraham. His seed would be the fullness of the Goyim. Shaul capitalizes on this in Romans 11, 12. When looking at the good and the bad, we have a parallel also of the wheat and the tares. Good and bad fish. When looking at this on a global scale, we see the kingdom contains a mixture within it. This is why the disciples, you can tell the disciple right away, they want you to do something. They eat, okay, let's go do this. Hold on. Examine the whole thing really quick. Because if you just jump the gun and go do every little thing, you might be hurting yourself. You might be hurting someone. The disciples said, pull them up. Let's just start dating. Let's rip them out right now. They were zealous. Let's tear those tears out of there. All right, go ahead and do it. Right when they run to the field, the Mashiach is going to be waiting for them. Then they're going to stop, turn around. Wait, which one's the tear? You have to wait till the harvest comes. And you'll be able to tell by the fruit that is being born, that will be the wheat. The tares will be doing nothing but bearing pride, standing straight up. Full of good stuff. 
the man without the wedding garment. The time came for the king to come into the banquet hall to see the guests, and a man without the wedding garments was in there. This type of looking at the guests was a deep look into the guests, and a man in the midst without the garments of righteousness. And who is this unnamed man? It's not Clark Kent. The wedding garment is the key, so we must look into this wedding garment, which will lead us into the next part of the study. The wedding garment. I want you guys to say this with me. Mishteh Beget. It's actually a feast garment. A feast mantle. A specific type of garment that identifies you as one who practices what they are saying. A feast garment. You've been marked with Sukkot. You've been marked with Yom Teruah. You've been marked with Shavuot. You've been marked with Pesach, with Yom HaBikorim, the first fruits. You've been marked with the Moadim, Yom HaKipurim. All of them. <clears throat> there is another definition of Beget, say Beget. Yeah. It's spelled the same way, pronounced the same way as garment, so the context will determine the definition of, of, and translation, which means betrayal or unfaithfulness. So there's a, those who reject the invitation, who reject the Moedim, will put on the garment that looks like the other ones, maybe, but in all reality, it's a garment of betrayal. The scripture says this man came without wedding garments. This means he had other garments contrary to the marriage supper. He didn't come in naked. It just says he didn't come with the wedding garments. That means he had some other type of garments of his own choosing. He had his own feast days put on. And his own time and way of doing things. And it didn't match up with the master's plan. The marriage supper of the Lamb is one that contains tzaddiks who have been clothed. Sorry John, I didn't mean that. Just kidding. <laughs> this man had garments of betrayal on instead of garments of the feast. And we could say he had garments of a golden calf system on. A golden calf speaks of betrayal. But there is another definition to this phrase in Hebrew for this man who didn't have wedding garments. And it's labush big day hatuna. The clothing garments of the husband. He did not have the garments of the husband on. So we see this parable is not only about Israel's history of rebellion as servants are sent, but also of a future time when the Mashiach would come. And there are three major garments one must put on. We need to note this down. So note this down. The garments of salvation. Yes, Robert? Um, I have two things. Go ahead. Number one, I would like to see the last slide. Okay. Alright. I'll do it right now. Let me just Undo my water. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Okay, and I believe that scripture you're thinking about with uh, Abraham, oh, Isaac, yes. Jacob, yes. uh, Matthew chapter 8, uh, 10 through 12. Can you read that for us? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, when Yahushua heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. He's referring to the or the what's his face? <laughs> Centurion. Yeah. Uh, and I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's some heavy words. Yeah. I'm not going to even try to expound on that. We've had a discussion on that before. And that is a, a very heavy, heavy discussion. Seasonal garment might be faith. Yes. Faithfulness. Be sure put that up here. Mark that down. Another garment, faithfulness. The garment of faithfulness. The garment of salvation. The garment of praise. The garment of righteousness. These scriptures declare these things. So the bride makes herself ready for the marriage of the Lamb by being clothed in pure, fine, and white linen of Emuna Tzedakha. Faith in righteousness. Belief in righteousness. We have been called 
to put on the Mashiach, Romans 13, 14, but put on the Master Yahushua Mashiach. Yes. In the Greek, that's Yahuwah Yahushua Mashiach. Love it. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Put on Yahuwah Yahushua Mashiach. Ah. That's even more profound and more powerful. Yeah. So put on the Master, or put on Yahuwah yeah. Yahushua. Hamashiach, yes. and make no provision for the lust of the flesh. I'm gonna have to change that. Thank you, brother. Thank all you guys. For as many of you as were immersed into the Mashiach have put on the Mashiach. Being immersed into the Mashiach, so who is the Messiah? Someone tell me, who is the Mashiach? The Word. He's the Word, he's Elohim. What else? So that means you have to put on the Word. You have to put on Elohim. What else? Who, who is the Mashiach? Righteous. You have to put on righteousness. Say it again. <laughs> He's the Melek Sadiq. We have to put on our royal priest. Our Melek Sadiq. Put on the Mashiach. There's a whole lot out there right now trying to kind of pour. Listen to this. If you try to pour the work of the Messiah into the vessels of Aaron and his sons, what's going to happen? They, won't, they cannot contain it. I'm hinting. For as many of you as were immersed into the Mashiach have put on the Mashiach. See that? We must put on salvation, faithfulness, praise, and righteousness. Psalm 35, 28. And my tongue shall speak of your righteousness and your praise all day long. Is that us? Yeah! Oh, yeah. <laughs> Come on. Ready to go to the next. <laughs> Zumba class. You want me to show you? No, it's not good. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Praise will bring your focus upon Yahuwah and not your situation. Praise will bring you to the place of selflessness and humility. Psalm 95 verse 1. Come, let us sing to the world, right? Sing to Yahweh. Let us raise a shout to the rock of our Yahushua, our deliverance, our salvation. Let us come before His face with thanksgiving. Let us raise a shout to Him in song. For Yahweh is a great El and a great Sovereign above all mighty ones, in whose hand are the depths of the earth. The mountain peaks are His also. He is the sea, for He made it, and His hands form the dry land. Come, let us bow and bend low. Let us kneel before Yahweh our Maker, for He is our Elohim, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Today, if you will hear His voice, do not do what? Do not be rebellious again like in the Marabah, the rebellion, the scripture goes on to say. Praise will cause the enemies of Israel to flee from before us. 2 Chronicles 20:21 20, says this. And after consulting with the people, he appointed those who should sing to Yahweh and should praise the splendor of set-apartness, holiness for some, as they went out before the army and were saying, Give thanks, Todah, to Yahuwah, for His kindness is everlasting. And when they began singing and praising, Yahweh set ambushes against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Yehudah, and they were all smitten. So when you praise and sing unto Him, you won't have a problem praising and singing on Shabbat. If you sing unto the world all week long, and then right before you come to Shabbat, you better believe your spirit is tainted. We should be singing unto Him. And I'm not saying be in a corner and all you're doing is, you know. But I am saying we need to sing unto Him the praises of who Yah is. Praise evicts all negativity. They evicts it. And complaining. The Father hates it. Psalm 103 verse 1. Bless you, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His set-apart name. Bless you, O oh my being. And do not forget all His dealings. Who forgives all your crookedness. Who heals all your diseases. 
who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with kindness and compassion, who satisfies your desire with good. Your youth is renewed like the eagles. Yahweh is doing righteousness and right ruling for all the oppressed. Praise invites the presence of Yahweh in your life, and you can read those scriptures. So the ones who did not have the wedding garments are cast out into outer darkness, where there is wailing and gnashing of teeth. Part of this is seen in Revelation 11.1, 1, and it says this, And a reed, like a measuring rod, was given to me, and the me me messenger stood, saying, Rise and measure the dwelling place of Elohim. The only time this is seen like this is in the book of Ezekiel. Saying, Rise and measure the dwelling place of Elohim and the altar and those worshiping in it. But cast out the outer court, excuse me, cast out the court which is outside the dwelling place and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, the nations, and they shall trample the set apart city underfoot for 42 months. In other words, when the tribulation time starts, it will be initiated by the sacrificial system up there. And the book of Revelation says, don't measure this, don't go there. The Gentile nations are going to trample it. So if you want to go try and worship me there, you're going to be trampled by the nations. That's not the altar you're going to be worshiping me at. Amen. Yeah. That's what the scripture says. Right. And I know I'll get another email for that because someone is always watching. <laughs> now we move into the next part of our teaching, the garments and the wineskins. Matthew 9.16 says this, And no one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on the old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment, and the tear is made worse. Neither do they put new wine into old wineskins. Or else the wineskins burst and the wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into fresh wineskins and both are preserved. You could teach this the opposite way and say the old is good. But that's not what the Mashiach is talking about. He's not doing away with the Old Testament. But he's letting you know that there is a time and a season for old wineskins which were once new. And then there is the season of the new wineskins where new wine is put in and poured in, which he is speaking about. But they put new wine into fresh wineskins and both are preserved. Mark 2.21 And no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. <laughs> I used to do that when I was a rocker. With real long hair. Uh, we cut holes and then we... We were like weird. <laughs> Sewing all kinds of stuff on it. We sewed our own pants, you know. Yeah. I was the only one. Huh? So, <laughs> you got that belt on top. Huh? <laughs> behave, Kurt. Behave, Kurt. Kurt, behave. You too, Mike. So no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the renewed piece will pull away from the old. You see, the new piece does not want to be attached to the old garments. They don't fit anymore. You probably know where I'm going, and you're right. And the tear is made worse. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the new wine bursts the wineskins. And the wine runs out, and the wineskins are ruined. But new wine is, put, is to be put into fresh wineskins. Luke 5, 36 to 39. Scripture reading is good, right? So we can understand and hear. Yes. Yeah. Before we expound on this and then we close and we go on. Right? And he also spoke a parable to them. No one puts a piece from a fresh garment on an old one. Otherwise the fresh one makes a tear. And also the piece that was taken out of the fresh one does not match the old. Powerful. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine shall burst the wineskins and run out. And the wineskins shall be ruined. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins and both are preserved. And no one having drunk old wine immediately desires new wine. For he says the old is better. Be careful what you've been drinking. There was a time for the old wine and people get used to that and that's all they want. Oh, I don't like that new brand. I never heard of that. What is that? It's a little more pure than many ship. It's honestly with the many ship. 
the same thing is today. You have people pouring you a glass of wine saying, just drink this old wine, it's older. It's going to taste better than this new wine, which the new wine is really even before that. Just go ahead and drink this. And then while you're drinking this, we'll get you drunk enough to where, you know what? You just might put on a Levitical Talit card. <laughs> because you're not, you're not paying attention <laughs> to what's going on. Let, let's get you drunk enough to where you'll just believe anything we say and then support everything we're doing. And we'll even let you look like a Levite, but you have no authority. We'll, we're the bet then you will do what we say, especially if you're drunk. Uh -huh. No good. <laughs> the parable is preceded with a question in regards to Yohanan's disciples and the Pharisees fasting. Remember, you'll see in the scripture where it says, How come your disciples do not follow the traditions of us? The traditions of fasting, the traditions of washing of the hands. Netilata daim. If you want to say that prayer, I, I do it, but it's, it's not so I'm not attached myself to rabbis. I go beyond just the hands. I say this, netilat ha panim, my face too. Netilat ha regalim, my feet too. Netilat ha lev, my heart too. I want wash me all, not just my hands, so I look like I'm doing something. Everything. Notice the connection between the disciples. If you read right before the parable, it's the disciples of Yochanan, John. And it says, and the Pharisees. Notice how these deci the disciples of John are still having some influence of the Pharisees of the time because they're grouped together saying, we're fasting. How come your disciples are not? So look at it. When did these Pharisees fast? Twice a week, all the time. Traditions. Tuesdays and Thursdays. I used to do it. Not that I was a Pharisee, but I did it because of the Orthodox school. Every Tuesday, Thursday, fasting and prayer. And then the prayers and the siddurs. The weekly siddurs. You, you, never mind. Look at it. <laughs> Many times throughout the year, such as the ten days of Ah between Yom Teruah and Yom HaKippurim, Esther fasted for three days before the approach to the king. Pharisees fasted in regards to the destruction of the first temple. In Luke 18, 12, it says this, I fast twice a week, the Mashiach speaking a parable. And I give tithes of all that I possess. And the Mashiach says, you know what? All that's rote because your heart is far gone. So of course the Mashiach was speaking a parable here. But I believe, I truly believe fasting is important. We should fast and pray. Why? Fasting suppresses the fleshly nature. So if you struggle with lust or cravings of any kind. Not when you people hear lust, all that sexual. No, it's not always that. You can push away from any table in your life. It's not just the lustful table. Push away from that and stay away from that table. Push away from the tables of the appetites of the flesh. Fast from those things that you do need. Stay away from the things you don't need. See that? You fast to break the power of flesh over your life. You fast to hear from the Almighty. When you fast, it's, you're dying. Did you know that? When you fast and pray, you're actually, your flesh is dying. You're, you're, you're robbing your flesh of water and food. Therefore, your flesh is beginning to die quicker. So your flesh, your spirit, that is saying, yes, 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 yes. A separation. So spiritually speaking, when you fast and pray, your spirit is being detached from what? Your nephesh is being detached from the fleshly man. And you have a gap, if we can say that, in the midst of your entire being that Abba can make a deposit now. And then when you break your fast, you don't go to Smorgasbord or all-you-can-eat place and pig out. You gradually feed the flesh what it needs. You don't live to eat. You just eat what you need to live. You have a lot of people, they can't wait. I want seconds and thirds and fourths and fifths. <laughs> they're, more, they're more concerned about the food they, they're going to eat tonight than the spiritual food that will sustain them beyond that. We need to look at the spiritual table that the Mashiach has set before us. Even if we only eat one time. There was a time my family and I were only eating rice you know, a few days out of the week. 
you know, we had our hard times. We didn't have a home or anything. We were living in a room together. And we had rice. And it was good with soy sauce. And you chop it up, make it look like little pizza pies. <laughs> we made it work. We don't live to eat. We eat to live to sustain this body for what we're supposed to do. So of course the Mashiach was speaking a parable here, but, but was using actual practices to point out the fasting that is used. Since we're in the season of the Moedim and Yom Kippur on the horizon, I would like to insert the most set-apart day when all practicing Yahudim fast in order to afflict their soul on Yom HaKippurim. There is no such thing in the Tanakh that says you have to fast on Yom HaKippurim, the Day of Atonement. There's that a verse. Well, yes, it does. It says you're to afflict your soul. The rabbis attach the afflicting of the soul is fasting from food, but yet some of the rabbis are sleeping with little children. Shh, tell me how that's afflicting your soul and breaking the bondages in your life, and then you still go to shul, and you, you teach the, the, the scriptures, and you teach the Talmud to the, the Talmud demon, probably look, not all of them, but some of them looking at their next victim. The afflicting of the soul has to do with more than food and more than water. It's important also to notice the words of Yahushua to the question pertaining to the disciples of Yohanan and the Pharisees. Are the friends of the bridegroom able to mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days shall come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they shall fast. Then their soul will be inflicted. True fasting should push you towards the things of the Father, not pull you away. So there comes a time, and we're in the season where we are, our souls are afflicted. That means our souls are detached, should be detached from the fleshly nature of power of man, and we should be thrust towards the ways of the Almighty, looking for the King like a bride who desires to be reunited with her husband again. He is married with her, stays with her, has a sabbatical for one whole year to please her and then to impregnate her and begin a family. And then he can go off to battle with the nation of Israel. She can't wait for him to return to see him again. Her soul is afflicted because he is gone. Is this helping somebody? Yeah! We will focus on the old and the new garments, the old and the new wine, the old wineskins and the new wineskins. So you might want to write some notes down. No matter what is being conjured up out there in regards to the master, Yahushua HaMashiach, when it comes to his royal priesthood status, we must understand that as we, as he was hated and disliked due to his priestly position, so shall we as his body. If you want to walk in His ways, the world will hate you for His name's sake. If you can go in the midst of the Catholic system, the Christian system, the Islamic system, the Krishna, the Hindu systems, and come all together and say, let's all take turns praying, something is wrong. But if you can stand in the midst with a prophetic mantle and say, repent, if you are Israel, return back to the ways of Yah. Drop these stone gods that have no power and return to the ways of the Almighty. I'm not praying with you guys. I'm turning my back on you and facing towards the King. The body has the responsibility of containing the substance of Yahushua HaMashiach. And we are in a battle today over the work of the Mashiach being completed and those trying to hold on to old wineskins. If we were to think about two groups of practice when it comes to the old and new, what would come to mind? Many within Christianity would probably say the old covenant is done away with and we have the new covenant now in Jesus. I used to say that in the church. Jesus. 
<laughs> when I would preach, seriously, it was a Pentecostal church if I, if I ministered. But the men's group, whatever it was, when we went to the retreats, you know, you get fired up. You yeah. emphasize Jesus. I want people to love Jesus. <laughs> but this is so far from the truth that we won't expound on it. We have a more serious discussion that continues to arise, and that is of the set apart and spiritual things the temple, the priesthoods, and the sacrifices. Old and new wineskins. Adam. When he was first formed and created, was infused as a body of light. And it was the very breath of Yahweh Elohim that made him a speaking spirit. The initial plan of Yahweh was for man to walk in the light. Psalm 89.15 Blessed are the people who know the festival, the festival trumpet call. They walk, O Yahweh, in the light of your face. Isaiah 2.5 house of Yaakov, come and let us walk in the light of Yahweh. John 12, 35, Yahushua therefore said to them, yet a little while, light is with you. Walk while you have the light. Lest darkness overtake you. Mashiach is the light. He's saying, walk as I walk while I'm with you. Don't be ashamed. And when I leave, keep walking in all that I have taught you. You will be burned you will be killed, you will be sawn in two, boiled in oil, pulled apart by horses, hung upside down, crucified upside down, tortured for my name's sake, but walk as a Melech Sadiq and don't worry about it. Ah. Easier said than done. Yeah. I'd be fighting tooth and nail. I'd probably get almost cannibalistic on them, rip them apart. No, I wouldn't. Come on, Israel did it. Doesn't mean we have to. Ephesians 5 8. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Master. Walk as children of light. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Hallelujah. Wow. And the blood of Yahushua Mashiach, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Come on. Walking is a metaphor for your life and how you live. Write that down. Walking in light is living in light. Doesn't mean that as you're living, when the street lights go out, you're going to light up like a light bulb. That's not what that means. But I tell you this, the spiritual aura on your life is evident. And the people around you will know there's something different because you're not laughing at the dirty jokes. You're not speaking the way they're speaking. You're not doing what they're doing. Your light is shining in the midst of dark practices. This is what has always been intended since the creation of Adam. Adam went from a body of ore, light. We've looked at this in you know, uh, Torah portion Breshit in detail. He was created in the body of light. And then he went from a body of light to a body of ore. Or, or, they're both the same in sound, but different. Here's light and here's flesh. That's the word for flesh. After the fall, you see this word come into play for the first time. After the fall. So Adam was covered in or after the fall. So those skins that Abba put on them was not the first sacrificial lamb. As, that does not say that at all. Many say, yeah, the first sacrifice God did in the garden. No, He didn't. It doesn't say that. This is a mystical, very powerful thing that's happening in Genesis. Yeah. It was a descent to the lowest state. So let's look at these words of Yahushua from its Hebrew origin. Here's what the Mashiach would have said from right to left. And I'll start right here. This is... Pretty much what he has, he would have said, if he was here. Ein Adam meshim matlit chadesha al shimla balaki yin natech miluya min ha shimla. I want to go back up here. Ein Adam 
משים מטלית חדשה. I want to look at that. No Adam puts on a new garment upon a worn out mantle is actually what this says. אין אדם משים מצלית חדשה על שמלה בלה upon a worn out garment. Here's a new garment here. חדשה מצלית is a new renewed garment. This is the word worn out. Garment. Notice the word for garment is different. That's what I wanted to point out. You guys see that? Yeah. Two different garments. Yahushua was making a declaration not only going back to Eden, but was going on, but what was going on during this time. The Pharisees and Yohanan's disciples come into play, and Yohanan, the true Aaronic high priest, and the Pharisees were paid imposters. So you had the Aaronic high priest, John, and then the Pharisees who were paid in imposters. The Hebrew word, matlit, can be read as a garment used for a Kohen Haggadol. But also from matal, which means to impose something on someone. No Adam imposes a new priestly garment upon that which is worn out or passing away. It was the other way around after the golden calf. The sons of Aaron priesthood were imposed on Israel. Abba doesn't impose a Melech Sadiq garment on Israel. That's what we're supposed to walk in from the beginning, not the other way around. So we have new and old garments. The worn out garment would not only infer the flesh of man, the old nature, but also the priestly authority that was given to Aaron and his sons due to a golden calf system of rebellion. And this was passing away and now and Yeshua was speaking of a new or a renewed garment which we are to function in, a garment that could not be torn or damaged, a garment, a priesthood that could not be torn, destroyed, or damaged, or grow old. That's why it's without genealogy, it does not yeah. grow old. It does not get worn out and cracked. And remember at his death, the temple curtain was torn from top to bottom, signifying the annulling of a priestly function of old. It exposed that the inside had nothing but stone, just like the hearts of the religious system of that wow. time. There had to come a change within the Torah, back to an intended purpose from the beginning. So we cannot put the new garment of the Melech Sadiq upon an old and passing away Aaronic Levitical garment, because it will cause a tear in the old. It would distort the old and try to bring the old priestly authority into the realm of the Melech Sadiq and it can't work. This would only make the Aaronic priesthood become scab. Hence the Hebrew word yinatech also means to be not, a, not only detached or torn, but it means to be scabbed with leprosy. So to try to cause that to function in the power of the Melech Sadiq, in comparison, it would make the Aaronic priesthood look like it had leprosy. Is that too much for you guys? Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Uh, true. It's in the Hebrew. Yeah. Not to say the Aaronic priesthood was leprous. No, it had its season as a wineskin, but grew old, and now the new wine that was being poured out through the Mashiach, Aaron's priesthood, his sons, his genealogy could not contain that. It was too powerful. It was too powerful to offer up animal sacrifices. It needed something more powerful, something from the beginning. Not a physical lamb born here in the earth, but a lamb that has been before the foundation of the earth. The Aaronic priesthood is to be left in its place. But today many are trying to put the new garment of the Melech Sadiq upon the worn out garment of Aaron. Al Shimla Bala. This Hebrew word for worn out is found in the second scroll in Ezekiel 23.43 in regards to the temple in Jerusalem being a whore. Go figure that out. That is intense. The temple system and the priesthood have become worn out due to adultery and idolatrous behavior in the porches. 
Someone that is a whore, a prostitute, after years go by, gets worn out, beat up because of the drugs and the abuse on their body. They look older than what they really are. Yahushua is using his words wisely and without hesitation here. The numerical value of this Hebrew word, I only did this once. Or this, this Hebrew phrase for worn out garment is the same as arura. Say arura. arura. Which is a curse found in Genesis 3.17 when Elohim speaks of the ground being cursed for the sake of Adam. Adam wasn't cursed. Says the ground is cursed for your sake. So now you can work in the midst of a cursed ground and cause a blessing to come out of it. No man puts a piece of new garment, which speaks of a remnant of the whole, onto a worn out garment. When the priestly garments wore out, they were used as the wicks of the menorah, as stated by rabbinic sources. Even the worn out garments of the Aaronic priesthood would be immersed into the oil and consumed by the light of the menorah. But if we take out of its intended place, place it will result in bala, scabbing. So Aaron's priesthood had its place as a schoolmaster. Keep things in their rightful place and position. Today a man-made temple system is being erected. And yes, Yahweh will use that to bring about prophecy. But it doesn't mean it is his heart for us to follow it. He used empires and religious systems of men to bring about prophecy. This system is an old garment. When Solomon built the temple, the Shekinah dwelled in the temple, but not in the priesthood or the people. Oh, oh. Wow. Even the, the Talmud, not the, I'm not teaching the Talmud, but I've read things in, from the Talmud. The Talmud even says the Shekinah dwelt among the people in the temple, never in them. Not even in Aaron. And it says when the temple was destroyed, the Shekinah left yeah. with the exiles in exile. Yeah. So this was never Yahweh's intended purpose for his nation. In Shemot 25.8, the scripture says this, Ve'asu li mikdash ve'shakanti betocham and they shall make him for me a sanctuary, and I will dwell inside of them. That's the uh -huh. literal translation. Yeah. I will dwell inside of them. So even with the making of the Mishkan, he was still teaching us of his desire to dwell in us, not in a tent. What do we want to build up the brick? Look at the, the altar they have in the temple. So it's made of red bricks. That's a straight up Nimrod altar. Yeah. It is a Nimrod altar. I'm speaking to the camera. The, the Temple Institute made a Nimrod altar. And everybody's all excited. The altar, according to scripture, is made of unhewn stone. That's hewn out stone, perfected cement in there, and the horns on it. Whatever, I'm not going to that. That's a boring party. The old garment that is wearing out is this flesh, the priesthood, and old life. And it's time to put on the new garment of the Melech Sadiq in Yahweh Yehoshua Mashiach. When we read the first scroll in Ezekiel chapters 8 through 11, part of it, it speaks of his presence leaving the corrupt garment, I mean temple. The time of the true temple of Yahweh would later be created by the hands of the Mashiach. And we as the living stones of Yahuwah would once again be filled with the Ruach. Remember the Mashiach spit on the ground? It says he spit on the Adama. So he transformed the once cursed ground and began to start the healing process for those who were blind. Yeah. Going back to the tear in the old garment to try and attach the newness of Yahushua onto the Aaronic garments would make the tear worse. The Aaronic priesthood was used as a temporary garment until the first coming of the Melech Sadiq Yahushua HaMashiach who would come and give us the new garments of righteousness as the prophets continue to speak of. Is this okay? Yeah. Anybody in the house? <laughs> Any Levites watching? 
<laughs> the second part of this parable continues to expand on the old and the new. People do not put new wine into old wineskins or else the wineskins will burst open. And the new wine would be poured out and the wineskins would be ruined. Think very hard here as I have. If you are trying to put back on the old man and fill that old wineskin with the one new man, your wineskin will burst open and all that good wine that you receive from the Mashiach will be poured out as if it had never been inside of you. Don't put on the old works of the flesh as Shaul speaks of in Romans and Galatians and then think the one new man wine will permanently sustain in your wineskin because it will not. There must be a sanctification unto set apartness. A new life in Mashiach as Colossians 3.3 3 speaks of must be discovered and practiced by you and I. The Hebrew word for wine is yayin. Say yayin. Yayin. And it means wine. Pretty profound, huh? Yain yeah, is going. Nine. But look at this. There's a saying, everybody's heard it. When the wine goes in, the secrets come out. <laughs> this is why those who are promoting a Levitical hierarchy are trying to get you and I to drink the wine. Can I say this? Yeah. Yes. They're trying to get us to drink from the cup of the wine of wrath before the uh, before Abba pours it out and people are drunk with it. I'm not doing it. Uh -huh. To drink from the cup of a so-called Levitical system is to drink and prepare you for the cup of wrath. Because the system is going to support a system seen in the book of Revelation that says this, And the city in which the Mashiach was crucified, yes, Sodom and Gomorrah, he wasn't crucified in Sodom and Gomorrah. That's because Jerusalem has become as Sodom and Gomorrah yeah. with a priestly system that is not sanctioned by Yah. So we can't go there. I almost said something I'm not going to do. Oh. The numerical value for Yain is the same as Sod, which means secrets and mysteries. So the same thing, the yayin goes out, the secrets, the mysteries come out. The true wine goes in, the secrets and mysteries of the Mashiach comes out. When his ruach is poured in us, then we can bring out the truth of who the Mashiach really is. 1 Timothy 3.16, and without controversy, great is the mystery, follow along, of godliness. I brought three translations in here. This is the King James, the first one. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. From the Hebrew Roots Version, Truly great is the divine mystery of righteousness, which was revealed in the flesh, was justified in the spirit, was seen by cherubs, was proclaimed among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. The Institution for Scripture Research Translation, and beyond all question, the secret of reverence is great. Who was revealed, reverence was revealed in the flesh, declared as tzedek, righteous in the spirit, was seen by messengers, was proclaimed among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in esteem. Notice this, when the true wine goes in, the secret mysteries of who Mashiach is comes out of you, and when it comes out of you, that's the new wine. But those who are drinking from the old wine, they don't like the way that wine tastes because it goes against the grain of what they're promoting. Your garment of righteousness in Mashiach doesn't fit the passing away garment of Aaron and his sons, which has passed away, which many have already made, and they're trying to create and conjure up again clothing for Levites. Should I just stop now? That's going to get worse. How many people are hungry for Oneg?
Sorry, sorry, I'm not even reading. I'm just going to go home. All this Shabbat Shalom is good. I'm almost done. Oh, that was funny. I needed that. I'm here already. I'm not moving. In order for this new wine of truth to come out with understanding and conviction, the wine scheme must be new. There is not a verse anywhere in the Tanakh, in the Talmud, or any Christian source stating that the sons of Aaron, Levites, were ever filled with the Ruach HaKodesh as the book of Acts shows us. The old skins are the priesthood that has passed away now. And the Medic Sadiq royal priestly position is that new wine skin which the new wine of his Ruach is poured into. Hallelujah. Uh -huh. If you don't believe it, then you got to throw the book of Acts out too like you did the book of Hebrews. <laughs> and I'm not going to say where... <laughs> No, I made a mistake. Focus, you guys. Focus, focus. I'm not getting caught up in mess. God bless you. Thank you, Thomas. Acts 2.15, For these men are not drunk, as you imagine, since it is only the third hour. As you see, when you walk in the Medic Sadiq, people are going to assume, oh, you're drunk, you don't know what you're talking about. It doesn't lie. You're speaking bad ball. It doesn't line up with what the board is saying over here. You know, this person, them, 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 and them. Whatever they say, just go with that. See, what you're saying is bad, well, it doesn't match what they're saying. But the truth tzaddiks will stand up and say, they're not drunk as you imagine, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Yoel, and it shall be in the last day, says Elohim, that I shall pour out of my ruach on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters, John 1.12, to them that believe in Him, have been given the right to be called sons slash daughters of Elohim. Wow. Shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. And also on the male servants and on the female servants, I shall pour out my new wine in those days, and they shall prophesy. So here we have the new wine skins filled. I'm not, I'm, hopefully I'm not, it doesn't sound like I'm yelling at you guys. I just get a little pumped. I get a little fired up. I'm not yelling at you guys. You're good, you're good. Believe me, I'll yell at myself first. Why did you do that? I've actually done that. Now work. I've dropped something. Like, Why did you do that for you? Is that a deep one of these? Wow. I put myself down. Then he has to lift me up and says, John, stop beating yourself. I'll get up off the floor. That's me. I'm going to Here we have the new wineskins filled with the empowerment to walk in the Melech Sadiq order and anointing. And interesting, the Greek word oinos speaks of fermented wine. Listen to this. Very powerful. And it's used in the parables that the Mashiach's talking about. And then in Acts which Yahushua was pointing to in his parables, uses the phrase new wine, which is a change in the language and dimension. It goes from oinos to the Greek word glukos, only in acts with the infilling of the Ruach HaKodesh. So the change goes and it's, it's elevated to a greater standard in connection to the work of the Mashiach. The new garment is the mantle and anointing for Melech Sadiq's service in the world, not behind a man-made temple wall. And the new wine poured into new wine skins are you and I. We are new wine skins in which His Spirit is poured into, in which the garments of righteousness, Aaron and them, not to not to belittle. Some people are bashing Aaron, not to bash Aaron. And, they did, a, they did righteous things in the eyes of Yah as a schoolmaster system to point us to the greater good in Mashiach. But now those wineskins, if we were to try to pull those out, they're cracked. They had their expanding season for 1,500 years. And if it goes any further than that, now it's going to burst. So the new wine that the Mashiach came, Yahukanan knew about it. He said, I am not worthy to unlatch the sandal shoe. He could even say, I am not worthy to take the cap off of that wineskin bottle. 
That is the new wine we waited for. We can't contain that. And John is greater than all of Abraham and all of Moshe, all of them, remember? Right. Yeah. There has not risen to a greater one that comes from the womb than John the baptizer. Mm -hmm. Except for he who is least in the Malchut HaShamayim, the kingdom of heaven. The Melech Sadiq, the ones who just come in, remember in the highways and the byways that are just coming in, are greater than Yochanan in Mashiach. That is some heavy stuff. Yeah. The wineskin is Israel, which is taken from among the nations. We were the assembly in the wilderness, according to Acts 7.38, and his Malchut in the earth. In Mashiach, we as a nation become Elohim's new wineskin in the earth. Israel is the new wineskin and Elohim pours the new wine of his Ruach in us with the adoptions, the covenants of promise, the promises, the fathers, the Mashiach, and the oracles of Elohim are poured into the new wineskins. All this poured into these new wineskins which are us. Shaul calls this old wineskin the Jew's religion. Galatians 1. Wow. In conclusion, God, this guy talks too much. So as we begin today with the king, we, we begin today with the king's marriage banquet for his son, and the focus on deep examination of the guests and the proper garments for the feast, unless one is cast out as the man was because he intentionally came without garments, wedding garments. He evidently knew about the marriage banquet, but disrespected the protocol of the king and his son and came in the old garments that could not contain the new and was cast out into outer darkness and gnashing of teeth. We must put on the Mashiach who is our Melech Sadiq high priest. And in doing so, we put on the Melech Sadiq garments, this new wineskin that can only contain new wine of the Ruach HaKodesh. You see, the Melech Sadiq cannot be poured into a Ronic system. And that's what guy and religious people are trying to do in the Messianic Hebrew Roots Movement. I'm not pointing at one person, but I am making a declaration. That's real encroaching. The first time I ever heard the word encroachment was on this uh, the Time Changer movie. That Christian movie, you ever see that? That guy goes back in time? It's pretty cool. It's probably boring for you guys. I like that movie. And it's real simple. Back in the 1800s, he goes in, into the future. And he's seen how everything has come. He goes up on the movie. It's really cool. And he preaches a sermon of, of returning to God, the love of God. Like I was like, man, that is a good sermon. And then the pastor gets up. All right now, uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to sing another hymn. Uh, we're we're going to sing a song. Da, 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 da. They're singing. It's like, dude, he just preached an amazing word. And you can see the people in the audience like this. Because they're used to the sugar-coated nonsense. Yeah. You can't pour the Melek Sadiq into an Aaronic system. It will not work. The Melek Sadiq holds the Aaronic priesthood in his hand. And now that the Aaronic priesthood has done what they have done, he places them in his heart. He doesn't cast them off. He places what they have done in his heart, in his bosom. They return to El Shaddai. And now the Melech Sadiq does what he does and we come into that order with him. Remember over time the old wineskins crack no longer contain the expensive flexibility it once had. Therefore, the need of new wineskins is imperative. Aaron and Levi could not contain the Melech Sadiq. This would cause that wineskin, that whole process to burst open and the schoolmaster never being able to finish its teaching course, which pointed to Yahushua HaMashiach or Melech Sadiq. The old wineskins contain the sons of Aaron, Levites, Pharisees, scribes, and Sadducees. The old leaders of Yahushua's day wanted nothing to do with the new wine, with the exception of a few. Nachtimon, Shaul, a few. When Yahushua was finished speaking on this parable, the rest of the chapter, he and a woman, he, think about this. When he is finished speaking on this parable, 
a man comes and says, my daughter is dying. And he heads that way. And a woman on his way to go raise up this dying child's daughter breaks through the crowd. We all see that along with the issue of blood. And she touches the hem of his garment. He just got through speaking on garments. And now this woman touches his garment, but it's so powerful. She touches the garment and she is healed from her infirmity. The blood flow is dried up because she becomes a new wineskin which contains life. This woman represents Israel and what they're doing. The garment of the Melech Sadiq dries up the entire sacrificial system. Oh, oh, oh. Wow. Oh, oh. Wow. That's no longer does she walk in the old cracked garment which the Pharisees and Sadducees could not heal. They could not help because they were not part of the old wineskin vessels. The once cracked, broken, leaking, and rejected woman is made whole. The new wineskin of the Melech Sadiq himself makes this unnamed woman whole. A picture of Israel, just hold on, I'm going to show you something, who has been under an old wineskin system that was cracked and empty as we know. So look at what she said. She said this, Rock in a God. Bebik do ivashea. Which is this, Except I only I become into his garment, I shall be. If only, except I only become into part of this garment. I shall be saved. If only she came into, if she seen the Melech Sadiq in front of her, I'm going to just say it like this. She said, if only I can come into the Melech Sadiq garment, I will be whole and saved. Come on. Wow. So this woman said and knew if she came into contact with Yahushua's garment, not a physical garment, but his saving power in the Melech Sadiq, she would be made youthful. She connected to his resurrection before it happened. And this is why Yahushua said, I felt power leave my body. This woman grabbed the order of the Melech Sadiq with all her belief. And it dried up the entire blood flow. So if brother Yahuda will reach out like that woman because they're bleeding again. And grab the order of the Melech Sadiq. The sacrificial system will dry up once again. And they will see clearly and walk in their youth once again. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.